Hi guys, today I wanted to jump on really quick and talk about some of the top mistakes that I see owner trainers make. So I have been working with owner trainers both online and in person for years and I wanted to kind of share with you some of those top mistakes that I see people making over and over again so that hopefully you can start avoiding them. See, if I could have like one wish come true, it would be to download all of the information that I know about dog training and all the skills around dog training and service dog training that I have and download them straight into your brain. But I can't do that because that technology doesn't exist yet. So instead, what I'm hoping to do is allow you to learn from the mistakes that I have made because the mistakes I'm about to share with you, I have also fallen into all of them. Um, allow you to learn from the mistakes that I have made and the mistakes that I have helped my students work through so that hopefully you can begin avoiding them yourself. Because uh, I don't think there's a net, I don't think it's necessarily um, required that we all make the same same mistakes over and over again, right? I think we can learn from each other's mistakes and move past them. Um, all right, so let's, um, okay, I got, got distracted there for a second. Something funny popped up on my screen. It does that sometimes. So the first mistake that I have is rushing. This is absolutely probably like the top mistake that I see people make. And so it's probably the mistake that I should have shared last. You know, we should have gone like from the worked our way into the top mistake or something like that. But I see owner trainers rushing their training constantly. And it is the thing that makes the biggest like impact negative impact in their in their service dogs training as well is rushing through training i see people rush public access training i see people rush task training i see people rush training in general, I see people rushing their training and expecting way too much of a young dog. You guys want to remember that this takes two years to do. And it takes that long because it takes that long for you and your dog to acquire the required skills, to proof those required skills. It takes that long for your dog to grow up. Almost every single person who has come to me in person, unless they are coming to me with their brand new eight week old puppy, in which case we get to avoid this trap, Every person who brings an older dog to me, so older than 12 weeks, the biggest problem with their training is that they have rushed things. They have pushed things too far too quickly, and they are expecting too much of a young dog. So of course, we are like right at the tail end of our adolescence workshop, right? We did a four-part free workshop all about working through adolescence. And the first part of that workshop, we talked a lot about about what is going on inside an adolescent's brain and how it's still maturing and how it's susceptible to a positive or negative spiral and how nobody wants a negative spiral happening with their service dogs, right? And so we used the rest of the workshop to talk about how to avoid or correct a negative spiral and turn it into a positive spiral. And I have put the link to the classroom for our workshop inside the description of this video. You can also find all of the replays inside our free Facebook group, Train Your Service Dog with confidence. Now, rushing is a huge piece of that. If you haven't seen part one of our workshop, you are going to want to go back and watch that before it comes down on Thursday. So today's the 10th. It's Tuesday. I keep thinking it's a different day, but it is Tuesday. That is coming down at, at midnight Central Standard Time on uh, March 12th, Thursday, March 12th. If you have not seen that, you want to go back and watch that because you need to understand what's happening in your dog's brain and why rushing is so detrimental to what is going on in your dog's brain at this time. So again, you can find, of course, all that information. I put the link to the workshop in the description of this video. You can also find all the replays inside our free Facebook group. But rushing is absolutely one of the biggest mistakes that I see owner trainers make. And I see them make it constantly across the board. You guys, slow down. I see this especially in public access. Now, I did a live about a public access a few weeks back. We can also link to that here. I should have linked to it in the description of the video already, but I forgot. I did a live 
all about public access a few weeks back, talking about the stages of public access and how important it is to work through those stages methodically. So I will put the link to that uh, in the description of this video when I'm done here. And that is a really helpful resource. If you feel as though you are rushing your public access, you're going to want to watch that video. And really, even if you feel like you're not rushing it, you should probably go back and watch that video. Um, now, the second mistake I wanted to talk about is making sure that you are giving your dog time off. So not enough time off. Now, I see this happen um, both with training. So people train every single day for weeks and months on end. And when I see that happening, part of me wants to go, you know, high five. I'm so glad that you are taking your training so seriously and you are practicing so consistently. But you and your dog need time off. You need time off from the training. You need to take days, like whole days or whole weeks off where you just don't train at all. Now, I don't mean, you know, you aren't reinforcing good behaviors throughout the day or you are letting your dog um, get away with, you know, naughty things or whatever. Like, I don't mean we, you know, you always want to remember that every moment your dog can, like, is in your vicinity, if he can see you or smell you or hear you or he's interacting with you, he's learning from you. And we want to take advantage of that throughout the day. But what I mean is your dog needs some time off from public access. He needs time off from the formal training. He needs time off to be a dog, to de-stress, to decompress. Now, of course, one part of that is taking time off from the formal training sessions. Now, in part two of our workshop, we talked about freedom walks and how great these can be to provide a structured source of regular time off. Because while I said that, of course, you know, not enough time off is the mistake I see people make, I also see people make the mistake on the flip side of that, which is providing enough time off, but not doing it in a structured way. So when I say time off, I don't necessarily mean we're allowing our dogs to develop bad habits or anything like that. If you've heard the phrase, you know, positive does not equal permissive, um, that is what I kind of mean by a, you know, um, a structured approach to giving your dog time off because I want your dog to have free time. I want him to have time off. He needs that. But that doesn't mean that we're doing a free for all and allowing him to develop bad habits. So again, you know, if you haven't seen part two of the workshop, which is all about freedom walks, you're going to want to go check that out. This is the part of our workshop that has, we have been getting tons and tons of comments and emails and Facebook messages about how big an impact this one thing is already making in people's and dogs' lives and changing their training with their adolescent dog. And we only did that a week ago. Part two of the workshop is only a week old, and we are already seeing people say how big of an impact they are seeing with implementing these freedom walks and doing them correctly with their service dogs and training. Now, the next mistake that I want to cover is not methodically proofing behaviors. Now, this goes hand in hand with the rushing that I talked about a moment ago. Now, proofing is the process of taking a dog from, you know, so part one is teaching a behavior. So we teach a sit, for example, right? We teach the dog how to sit. We put it on cue. And a lot of people stop there and they say, now my dog knows how to sit, but that sit actually needs to be proofed. We need to go through a methodical process to teach our dogs to respond to that sit cue and perform that sit behavior around distractions and around new people and new dogs and, and new environments and things like that. I see way, way too many owner trainers teaching something like a sit and then just just assuming now my dog knows how to sit and they go to the mall and then they wonder why their dog won't respond to the sit cue at the mall. And it is because they have gone from zero to a hundred without any of the steps in between. So proofing is something we want to do methodically. It's something we want to take time to do. It's something we want to do intentionally. We want to introduce distractions in small amounts. So um, one of my favorite things I've ever heard Hannah Brannigan say, and she has that amazing podcast, Drinking from the Toilet, that you all should be subscribed to and listening to on a regular basis. She says, think about training in Lego blocks, not in cinder blocks. And I think the same goes for our proofing. So when I say proofing methodically, a cinder block would be going from teaching your dog to sit in the living room to make to just straight jumping to the mall 
right? Those are cinder blocks. That's a huge step in criteria. We want to take that and break that down. We want to introduce it to smaller, more controllable distractions and then slowly increase those distractions. And then, t you know, we want to proof in a methodical way. Now, this is something, of course, you know, I'm going to just really quick here say the Academy is open for registration, which I only mentioned because it's only open until Thursday at midnight. We only open the Academy a few times a year. I have no idea when it will be opening again. So if you want to join, you can find all the information at the a link in the description of this video. But in the Academy, we take our students from step one to step 100. We teach them how to methodically introduce distractions, how to methodically work through into new environments. We have a whole ebook inside of our Academy dedicated solely to this process so that our students can print it and have it at their fingertips whenever they need it. This is absolutely one of the top mistakes that I see people make over and over and over again. I see people, um, st new students who are just coming to us, new students who are just joining the Academy, people in our free Facebook group saying, you know, why doesn't my dog sit in public? He knows it at home or he does it at home. Why doesn't my dog fill in the blank? And it is always because the dog has not gone through a methodical and intentional proofing process to make sure that he knows how to sit in all these different environments and around all these different distractions. Because the thing about distractions and teaching, well, the thing about cues is that when you teach a behavior, everything around you can accidentally become a part of the cue. The room you're in, the treats you use, the shirt you're wearing, the how you're standing or how you're sitting, these things can all become a part of the cue. And if you aren't intentional about making sure that your dog truly understands the important cue, the word sit, then you can't methodically prove it. See, this is brings us right into um, the next mistake, which is not understanding learning theory. So what I'm kind of rambling at you here about is a, is a science of, it's the science of how learning happens. Okay, the science behind dog training. It's about learning theory. All animals learn the same way. Humans, dogs, cats, elephants, fish, we all learn the exact same way. So one of my greatest pet peeves is when I hear people say, all dogs learn differently. False. All dogs learn exactly the same way. They are just motivated differently. So where, you know, in my home, I have just a couple of dogs who will do anything for a hot dog. I have a couple of dogs who go, yeah, hot dog's great, but what I really want is a tennis ball, right? So all dogs learn exactly the same way. All people learn, all animals, all animals learn exactly the same way. And if you are going to do this thing called owner training, you have to know what professional trainers know, okay? You have to understand the learning theory. And there are lots and lots of really great places for you to, to um, learn the, the, you know, the science of how dogs learn. Hannah Brannigan's podcast that I already mentioned is one of them, right? But of course, you can also learn all these things inside the academy. This next mistake, so learning theory, I have told you in order to do this thing called owner training, you have to understand the learning theory. You also, so you have to know the things that owners, you, excuse me, I get really excited. You have to know the things that professional trainers know, and you have to have the skills that professional trainers have, which leads me to poor mechanics. This is also one of the top mistakes that I see owner trainers make. And in fact, if I am watching a video, if I am about to watch a video inside of our Facebook group for our members of our academy, where they post videos of their training sessions for me to get feedback, when I'm about to push play, the number one thing that would predict whether or not I'm about to watch a successful training session or an unsuccessful training session is whether or not that student has good, clean mechanics. Now, of course, you've heard me talk about mechanics. If you've been hanging around a while, you have heard me talk about mechanics because they are unbelievably important. So this idea of clicking on time, if you use a clicker, although you should be using a marker, marking on time, being clean with how you reinforce your dog when you move your hands. The training is a physical skill. It is a very customizable, adaptable physical skill. So you don't have to do things exactly as I do them, which is one of the reasons that I love clicker training and training with a marker. Because if you have a disability that impacts, you know, how you physically 
can use your hands or how you fit, you know, impacts you on a physical level. You don't have to have the exact same mechanics that I have. We can customize them so that they work for you. But they do have to be clean and they do have to be consistent, as consistent as you can make them. And this is, again, something that, of course, we help you inside the academy with. We help our students um, customize this inside of our Facebook group. But the number one thing that will determine whether or not a training session I'm about to watch is going to be successful is whether or not that student has clean and intentional mechanics. Okay, so this impacts, it impacts everything. Your dog's ability to learn, your dog's ability to focus, how quickly you will learn, how much you will struggle. It impacts everything about your dog's training. Every single thing you do with your dog is impacted by your mechanics. And this is just like unbelievably important for you to understand and for you to start practicing those mechanics so that you can be consistent and you can be clean and you can be clear. Okay. So one of the things we've talked about inside of our adolescence workshop is that our service, our adolescent service dogs, their brains are primed to find the reinforcement. They are searching for reinforcement and they are searching for consistency. And their brains are absolutely primed to soak up that reinforcement. This is why you need to go back and watch, watch our four-part series if you haven't watched it yet. But what was I saying? Um, oh, yes. Okay. So if you have sloppy mechanics, that is essentially the exact same thing as you watching a static ETV channel. You have to work through all of that static to get the information on the channel that you are looking for. When you have poor mechanics for your service dog, when you're training your service dog, you are a static ETV channel. And just like you or I, your adolescent dog who is primed to find the reinforcement is going to change the channel. He's going to change the channel from you to something that is more consistently reinforcing, like other dogs or squirrels or other smells or other people or fill in the blank about what your dog is distracted by. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I have a student bring a dog to me who will hardly look at their person. They're looking over here and they're looking over here and they're looking over there and they're looking at everything but their human. The moment I clean up their human's mechanics, within five minutes their dog is staring straight at them wondering what we should be doing. Because it is that important that it happens that often. Now, the last mistake that I want to cover with you guys is not providing a warm-up sequence, a warm-up series um, in all of your training, but especially when you are training off your property. So if you are training in your living room, your warm-up series can probably pretty be you know, pretty small, pretty short, because you're in your living room where your dog lives, there's not a whole lot going on. But if you're going to take your dog off your property for training, which you have to do in order to train a service dog, you really need to be using some type of warm-up sequence the moment you get out of your car that allows your dog a moment to acclimate, to look around, to see where he is, to take in the environment, and helps him become focused and helps you determine like what his mental state is, right? So in our academy, one of my favorite lessons is where I teach people about, I call them barometer behaviors, other trainers call them... Um, like warm up sequences or baseline sequences all these we all us trainers we have different terms for it, are basically the same thing but the the barometer behaviors are one of my favorite things that we teach inside the academy which is basically you know the cliff notes version is that you need to have a series of behaviors that you understand you know how your dog performs those behaviors under normal circumstances so this goes to something like, you know, what I call the orientation game, which is attention to handler, the attention loop, you know, where I'm going to mark when my dog looks at me and then I'm going to give him a treat. And then I'm going to wait for him to look at me again. When, when he looks at me, I mark and I give him a treat. I want to know exactly how my dog performs that behavior at home. So that when we go to a new environment, I can compare how he's performing that behavior now with how he performs that behavior at home. And just like the dashboard on my car, I can quickly and at a glance get an idea of how, how distracted my dog is, how nervous he is, how well he's focusing on me, how successful he is, how much help he needs from me. I can get all of that by using these series of barometer behaviors. Just like the dashboard on my car, I can very quickly, at a mo in a moment, 
understand a lot about my dog's mental state. Now, what this also allows us to do is prevent things from going badly. So one, if I don't have a slide for this, but like a bonus mistake that I see people make a lot is ignoring or not being aware of the smaller behavioral changes in their dog that are leading up to a bigger problem. So for example, if we are in public and I don't notice that my dog all of a sudden takes his treats differently and he's not responding to the marker the same way he responds to at home and maybe he gives a little bit of a tongue flick and then all of a sudden he quits taking treats and he's so distracted he can't respond to any known cues. It really didn't happen all of a sudden. The moment my dog started taking treats differently, I needed to step in and help him. Okay, And so that's like a bonus mistake that I see people make. Now, of course, we cover all of this inside the academy. Right from the very beginning to the very end, we, I, we have methods and, and stuff for all of these things. And the barometer behavior lesson is one of my favorite, my very favorites. Now, I've seen questions pop up, and I'm going to go and see if I can answer any of these. Now, if you guys have questions about anything that we've covered here, go ahead and throw them in. Um, but we're going to kind of try and keep it a little bit on, on, um, t- on topic here. That's the word that I'm searching for. So we're going to try and keep it a little bit on topic, but if you guys have questions about what I've talked about today, go ahead and throw them in. Now, of course, if you have any questions about the Academy, you can ask us either inside our Facebook group, Train Your Service Dog with Confidence. You can ask them right here on this video. Um, You can ask them on this page. You can email us. Um, But it is only open for a a little over 48 hours. We only have registration open for about 48 hours now because we like to, just like a college course, have all of our new members come in at once and then we're we're able to really provide a much better experience for new members and new students. Um, that way, when we have them all kind of start at once, we work through the beginner material together, and then we move along together. So we are closing registration down Thursday the 12th um, at midnight Central Standard Time, and I honestly do not know when we will be opening again, but it will be at maybe in the fall. It will absolutely not be before the fall that we will be opening the Academy again um, for new members. So if you want to learn more about that, you can find all the information there at the Um, in the link in the description of this video. And of course, remember that on Thursday, when we close the doors to registration, I'm also going to be taking our adolescence workshop and moving it just inside the academy so that we can really focus on our new members. And so if you haven't watched that yet, you're going to want to watch that. So far, this has been our most popular workshop. We are getting the most, people are having the biggest results from this workshop than from any of our other previous free workshops that we have done today. All right, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead uh, about what we've talked about today, you know, go ahead and definitely throw them into the comments. Um, So Heidi has questions about confidence. So Heidi, I believe you are one of our new members to the Academy, in which case I'm so happy to have you. We have a whole um, web class in the Academy on confidence boosting, and we will work you through that. Confidence boosting exercises are worked into the academy starting in level like two. So the way the academy works is we have, um, there, well, there's lots of things inside the academy. One of them is our core curriculum, which is, you know, our service dog training pyramid turned into a course. It's broken into four stages and each stage is broken into multiple levels. So it is step by step. And in those step by step, in those stages, we have lots of lessons on confidence boosting right worked right into the core curriculum. So the curriculum covers everything from basic obedience to foundation training, which if you know me, you know doesn't necessarily include basic obedience. It includes um, foundations for tasks, foundations for public access, and then working right into public access. But some of those really important foundations include confidence boosting, which is important for dogs, not only dogs who are lacking confidence, but dogs who don't appear to be lacking confidence at this point because we want to keep their confidence high. Um, And so we have that built in right from the very beginning of the core curriculum inside the academy. Um, TJ wants to know, it's been my health, but how do I know if I'm not working diligently enough so that she doesn't forget the last lesson? So here's the thing about owner training. You have to take care of yourself, okay? So if you have to take time off because of your health, take time off. Okay. This is important. You don't even need my permission, but if you want it, you have it. 
take time off to take care of yourself. Your dog also needs time off. So this will just also, you know, allow your dog to have some time off. Only you can tell me. I I tell people to aim for, you know, one 20 minute training session, five days a week. Start there and then see how that goes. You can, you can add or subtract training sessions from there. Okay. Now, if you're not seeing progress in your dog's training, one of the problems could be that you're not training often enough. But if you're not training often enough because of your health, that's okay. It just means that this process is going to take you a little bit longer and that's fine. But only you can know if you are not training your dog because you're just being, you just didn't feel like it. Or if you're not training your dog because you need time off. Those are two different things and only you know which one you're doing. So in the academy, we have people ask this question all the time. Okay. And, you know, about taking time off and, and how much time and, and I, and I feel like I'm behind because I had to take time off for my health and all these things. You, of course, will only make progress with your dog if you train regularly. That's the only way to do this, is to spend the time doing the training and doing the work. There is nothing me or any other trainer can do for you if you don't go home and practice. But only you can decide if you're not practicing because you just don't feel like it and maybe you're being, you know, you kind of need like to kick yourself into gear and step up and do the work. Or if you're not training enough because your health is demanding that you take time off. And if your health is demanding time off, then you need to take your time off. And that's, that's fine with you. Just do that. Um, okay, I'm looking for other questions. So Carolyn asked, um, will the attention loop create an auto check-in? So the attention loop is what I talked about a little bit earlier. This is something we talked about in, um, I think, part three of the workshop. So if you want to see the attention loop in action um, and you want to kind of see some of those training demos, those are in part three of our adolescence workshop. Again, you can find the information in the link in the description description of this video. Um, the attention loop is how I teach auto check-ins. Now, of course, we already talked about the importance of methodical proofing, and the attention loop is, is not an exception to that. So yes, the attention loop will absolutely teach an auto check-in, but only if it is methodically proofed around distractions. So you can't just do the attention loop at home, then take your dog to, you know, the mall this weekend and ask me why he's not doing an auto check-in or say that my attention loop didn't work. Because the, you know, the attention loop will only transfer to public if you methodically proof it around distractions and in new places, like 90%, maybe, maybe that's a little high, but most of a, a huge percentage, a huge majority of service dog training is really just about proofing, about understanding how to methodically proof a behavior and then methodically proofing every single behavior that your service dog needs to learn. Now, if you need help with the proofing, of course, we can help you with that inside the academy. That starts from like... I think level one, we right away start proofing. It might be level two, but right away in the core curriculum in our academy, we start with proofing because it is that important and you need to understand it. So the short answer is yes, the attention loop auto, like definitely creates an auto check-in. The slightly longer answer is that only if you proof it around distractions and in new places. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, really quick, uh, Genevieve wants to know how much is the Academy? You can find all the information about the Academy at the link, um, but it is a $37, $37 a month membership site. So you, you're, um, however you choose to pay, you will be automatically recharged $37 every month, but you can quit, you can cancel at any time. Um, so that's kind of how that payment works. So Allie has a question. Um, it takes me a few minutes to unload my dog from the car. I have to close the crate and put up the ramp etc. Would you do barometer behaviors and warm up your dog to the new environment before loading up your car and closing it up? Or do you close the car and then um, get your dog comfortable with the new environment? So I am going to say that this is an excellent question and it depends. So the question is, you know, you all know we get our dogs out of the car, we have to close the car, lock the car, do whatever. Do you leave the car open and do your barometer behaviors or do you close the car and then do the barometer behaviors? I'm going to say this depends on your dog. 
in most cases, I, you know, I close the crate, I close the car, I lock the car, and then I go into the barometer behaviors because your dog needs time to acclimate to a new environment. So, uh, you know, and, and here's another bonus mistake for you is that I see way too many owner trainers get their dog out of the car and expect them to just start training just like that. But that's not fair. You, especially a service dog in training, a green or young dog, needs time to acclimate. He needs time to look around, to see where he is, to feel safe, to feel adjusted, all of those things. Now, that acclimation time, that goes down. So, like, with an advanced dog, for example, with one of my advanced dogs, by the time I've closed the hatch on my car, they're looking at me and they're like, I've acclimated, I'm ready to go, let's do the thing. Okay, but with a novice dog, they may need a whole minute or a whole two minutes to just look around and just see where they are, take it all in, acclimate to the environment. So I'm going to say it depends on the dog, but that time of you closing the car, it's not necessarily wasted time because your dog probably needs that time to acclimate. Um, okay, would the academy be for my dog who has been through training but seems to constantly need more training? Like, how do I keep my dog working and not losing his sharpness or alerting? Okay, so this is, again, an excellent question. And another bonus mistake for you. You guys are just like, you're throwing them at me. This is great. Um, one of the other mistakes that I see people make is they teach a behavior, and this kind of goes with our methodical proofing thing. They teach a behavior, they check it off, and they go, okay, my dog knows that behavior. It's done now. But the thing about behavior is that it's very dynamic. It's constantly changing. Your dog is never going to be done training. He's always going to need refreshers. He's always going to need um, behaviors always adapting and always changing. So it is completely normal for a behavior that seems super solid one day to slowly evolve into something totally different over the course of a few months if we're not on top of things. So that's kind of just like another little mistake that I see people make. Um, so, but to Cynthia's question, like how do you keep your dog working and not losing his sharpness? One of those ways is to keep training, to keep practicing old behaviors, but also not to keep your dog bored. So one of the things that I think the Academy... I think is valuable. I personally, I think the Academy is valuable even for more advanced dogs who are like you're talking about. It seems like you've done a lot of training, but you constantly need more. Like maybe he's losing his sharpness or something. The Academy can absolutely help you with that because it is not just a list of behaviors. So yes, there is a lesson on sitting. There is a lesson on stay. There are also lessons on all kinds of things that I bet you've never even thought of to teach or practice. We have games, we have exercises, we have behaviors you probably never thought to teach. One of my main goals in, in creating the academy was to teach people things that, to teach you things you don't even know you don't know. To answer questions you don't even know you should be asking. So there is lots of really great free resources online. But if you don't know what question to ask, you will never find that information. So like I said at the beginning of this live, I wish, I really truly wish that I could just take all of the information from my brain and have it like uploaded and downloaded, whatever, into your brain so that you would know all the things that I know and you would have all the skills that I have, but that isn't how it works. So instead... The next best thing is for me to create a place for you to let, you know, step by step learn the things that I know so that I could share these things with you step by step. So even if you are, even if you or your dog are a little bit more advanced, the thing about training a dog is you will never know all the things there is to know. Never. It will never happen. And the moment you guys are working with a trainer who thinks they know everything that, it, they, that there is to know, you should find a new trainer, like instantly. Okay. Because... That's just, we're, the science is constantly teaching us new things. Trainers are constantly coming up with new and better stuff. My academy is not the only place to learn new things, but it is closing on Thursday. And so I don't want you to miss out. If you want to join, I don't want you to miss your opportunity to join. Um, so yes, I still think it will be helpful for you. And it will absolutely still be helpful for you. And that idea of losing the sharpness, of getting back on track, of learning new things, everything like that. Um, so we have a question, um, is checking barometer behavior something you always do forever or is it something you only do through the training process and then once they are completely trained, you just stay in tune with them to note any changes or challenges? So one of the reasons that I like 
okay, so the answer is yes and no, okay? You will always use your barometer behaviors. You won't use them as much as often or for as long. Because as your dog becomes, becomes closer and closer to fully trained, you won't need them as much. But the other thing about the barometer behaviors is that what you have said here is you have said, or do you just stay in tune with them to note any changes or challenges? The barometer behaviors are my way of giving you a system to be in tune with your dog so that over time, those barometer behaviors become second nature. Like I, when I'm, when I was in, um, I was in tractor supply the other day with Leo and I didn't consciously think, oh, his barometer behaviors are changing. We need to change something. It's second nature for me now. But the thing about dog training is that the things that are second nature for dog trainers are not necessarily second nature for you until we teach them to you in a process. So the barometer behaviors are just one example of where I have worked really hard, taken a lot of time to think about what is it, what is it specifically that me and other professional trainers do that allow us to have more success than owner trainers? What is it specifically? Because just saying we're more in tune with our dogs is not helpful. But what is helpful to you is for me to give you the barometer behavior system and to say, use these behaviors and use them in this way until you become what, you know, in tune, until you feel as though that label applies to you. So the answer is, yes, you will use them forever, but the way you use them will change and it will become second nature and you won't need them as much. So like right now, when I get Leo out of the car, we go through a very formal wor like warm-up routine that includes acclimating to the environment, includes our barometer behaviors. As he becomes more and more advanced, that routine will shorten until it is hardly recognizable at all. Um, and again, on like another bonus mistake for you guys that I see owner trainers make is they look at an advanced dog with a trainer like me and they say, they try to do things, they look at an advanced dog with a tr professional trainer and compare it to where they are now with their dog. You should not be comparing the beginning or the middle of your training journey with somebody else's end, okay? That doesn't help anybody. An advanced dog doesn't need a long warm-up routine, but a new dog might, and that's okay. Um, is it okay for my dog to shake her head while playing? Um, she doesn't unload the same door she loads in. Um, I'm not sure that I totally understand your question, but it is a little bit, I think, outside of the topic. So if you, again, Heidi, I'm almost positive that you are an Academy member. We've got a lot of new members, so it's taking me a little bit of time to memorize all of you or to like to recognize all of you on site. I'm pretty sure you're one of our new members, and so you can ask anything that you want inside of our Facebook group, and we will get, we will, either me or one of my coaches will answer you. Um, so I have a small coaching team inside of our Facebook group for our members, which is one of the big advantages to joining is that um, you can post a video or a question at any time and get direct feedback from me and my coaches as well as each other um, and our other members. And we have some other amazing members inside of our group now. One of the one of the reasons, along with not being able to magically transfer the information that I have in my brain into your brain, one of the other reasons that I created the Academy was because one of the things I'm sure you have noticed about dog training is that when you ask a simple question, like how do you get your dog to stop jumping on the counter? How do you teach your dog to, to, you know, to sit, fill in the blank? And you ask that question either on Google or in a Facebook group, you get a bunch of answers. And probably most of those answers are in direct conflict with other answers. So dog trainers like to joke, the only thing that two dog trainers can agree on is that the third dog trainer is doing it wrong. That's because there are so many methods and they conflict with each other. So what I wanted to give you, what I wanted to give owner trainers was a place that not only do you have the step-by-step -step information that you need inside of the Academy website itself, but you would also have a community where you could ask a question and get the support of professional trainers as well as each other and know that all of those answers are on the same track, that they won't conflict, they will work together. Um, 
And so that's one of my favorite things about the academy is the the community that has been built. And it is not something I could do alone. That is something that our incredible members have helped with. Um, okay. Um, this is a good question. So when you realize you haven't proofed a behavior properly, do you start at the beginning or the last successful place? I like to start a few steps back. So I like to go to my last successful place and go a few steps backwards. So not all the way back to the beginning, although you certainly can and work through those steps more quickly. But I personally say, okay, where was our last successful place? Let's go maybe two steps backwards and start there. And if my dog is successful, we can start to move forward. If two steps back, he's still struggling, we'll have to go even further back. But uh, that's kind of how I do it. We, we pick the last most successful place, and we start just a couple of steps previous to that. We don't go all the way back every time. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that dog training is very normal for it to feel like it's up and down and up and down. So if you've ever seen that graphic where it is like the, you know, um, how I feel, think dog training should be and it's like a straight line up and then um, how dog training actually is and it's like squiggly, 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 right? Where the general theme is up, but sometimes we're actually going backwards. That's really normal. And I think that if you go all the way back to the beginning, every time you have a small setback, you are never going to get anywhere because you are constantly going all the way back to the beginning. So you, it is totally normal and totally fine. And you should absolutely go backwards when you need to. But I don't think we have to go all the way back to the beginning every single time. I think that we can fall into that trap pretty easily. Um, okay. Sunlight says, it's definitely true. The Academy answers the questions you didn't know you had. Um, so often I learned something and then realized later I was wondering that very thing. I'm really glad to hear that because that was one of the goals, was to answer questions you didn't even know you should be asking and to teach you things you didn't even know you didn't know. Um, okay. Can any dog be a service dog? I have a Border Collie Dachshund mix. So not... Any breed can be a service dog, but not any individual dog can be a service dog. So um, this is again a little bit outside. The t this is outside the topic of what we're kind of we're trying to trying to keep it on, like on topic of these mistakes we've already talked about inside this uh, live. But I have a whole blog post on searching choosing a service dog, a breed, and then an individual. So we will get you, we'll post that when I get done here, we'll post that link in, in the comments here so that you can find it. Um, we'll give you that link. Um, we also have information on this right inside of our academy. It's something we do have members join before they have a dog. But we, I have information on this. A free, we have a free blog post on this, so I will make sure that I get that link to you because that will answer your question. Um, okay. Okay, so then we have one more question about the the web or the workshop. So we said um, you said in part three about shaping when it comes to tucking. So one of the things we talked about in part three of the um, the adolescence workshop is I showed a demonstration of using shaping to teach a dog to get in a box and lay down. Um, and I love the process of shaping because. It truly, truly allows you to teach your dog anything he is physically and mentally capable of doing while you, with, with you just standing there or sitting there. So one of the things I love about training with a marker, which a clicker is a marker, but you don't necessarily have to use a clicker, although I highly recommend it because it is worth the learning curve. Um, one of the reasons that I love marker training is that you can literally teach your dog anything he is mentally capable of doing while you are sitting in a chair. And when you are living with a disability, the ability to train your dog while seated can be huge. Um, so that's what we're talking about here is we did a shaping demonstration of that. Um, I am going to say though, but for your answer is that it's probably not that you need a different method like it's not so much that there's a better way to teach this is that there's probably a small thing that we can change about what you're doing that will change 
that will help you be successful. So again, one of the advantages to our academy is that our members post videos. And when you post a video and a professional trainer gets to see you actually train, like see it, what happens is my coaches and I generally pick up on really small changes that have a huge impact in your training session. So I'm guessing that it isn't like you need a new shaping method. It's just that there's a small change, a small tweak we need to make in how you're shaping that will fix your problem. And so if you're a member, if you're a new member, because I don't know you all yet, if you're a new member, absolutely post this to our members Facebook group so I can help you. Um, If you're not a member, of course, you guys can always be posting things to our free Facebook group and our amazing moderator team can help you there. So I have um, excellent moderators that I have hand chosen because they are excellent owner trainers with a lot of knowledge. Some of them are professional trainers as well. Um, And they can do that inside the free group as well. Um, okay. Is there a video or book on shaping? So in the academy, we have like lessons. We have a lesson specifically on shaping. Um, and then I can't think of a resource off the top of my head. Although I do love, um, everybody here, everybody watching this should read Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog at some point, um, which is a book called Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. (laughs) Um, everybody should read that. And she talks about shaping in there. Um, and that is, should be, that should be on everybody's must read list. Everybody should absolutely read Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor if you're trying to train a service dog, which you probably are if you're watching this live. Okay, so I think that that's going to be it for today. If you guys have any questions, and of course there will be a question that a that I miss because there's always a delay between when I talk and when your questions pop up. Um, but if there are any questions that I have missed, if you are a new member, you can ask anything that you want or, or one of our older members. If you're a member of the Academy, you can ask anything you want inside of our Facebook group and we will get you answered there. Um, but if you have an answer or if you have a question after I log off here, you can still ask them and we will do our best to get you an answer as well. Um, But just another final quick reminder, if you do want to join the Academy, all the information is in the link in the description of this video. Christina has also posted it here to the comments a few times. And um, we are closing registration in about 48 hours. So March 12th at midnight Central Standard Time, we will be closing doors to registration. And I do not know when we are opening again, but it will definitely not be before, um, it will not be before fall. So, all right. So I hope that you guys all have a great day. I hope that you found this helpful. Um, Let us know if you have any questions and make sure to catch up on the workshop before we take that down on Thursday as well. Have a great night, guys.